This is part two of chapter three, Rape of the Mind. The search for ecstatic experience is not only an individual search, it often reaches out to encompass whole groups. When moral controls become too burdensome, whole civilizations may give themselves up to uncontrolled orgies, such as we saw in the Greek Bacchanalia and the contagious dance fury of the Middle Ages. In these mass orgies, artificial stimulants are not necessarily used. The hypnotic influence of being part of the crowd can induce the same loss of control and sense of union with the outside world that we associate with drugs. In the mass orgy, the individual loses his conscience and self-control. His sexual inhibitions may disappear. He is temporarily relieved of his deep frustrations and the burden of unconscious guilt. He endeavors to re-experience the blissful sensations of infancy, the utter yielding to his own body, body needs and desires. The ecstatic participation in mass elation is the oldest psychodrama in the world. Taking part in some action results in a tremendous emotional relief and catharsis for every individual in the group. This feeling of participation in the magic omnipotent group of reunion and communion with the all-embracing forces in the world brings euphoria to the normal person and feelings of pseudo-strength to the weak. The demagogue, who is able to provide such ecstatic release in the masses, can be sure of their yielding to his influence and power. Dictators love to organize such mass rituals in the service of their dictatorial aims. Ever since man has been a conscious being, he has tried from time to time to break down the inevitable tension between himself and the outside world. When mental alertness cannot be relaxed now and then, when the world is too much and too constantly with him, man may try to lose himself in the deep waters of oblivion. Ecstasy, drug sleep, and its fantasies and swoons of mental exaltation temporarily take him beyond the burdensome effort of keeping his senses and ego alert and intact. Drugs can bring him to this state, and any addiction may be explained as a continuing need to escape. The body cooperates with the mind in the search for an evasion of life, and drugs gradually become a body need as well as an emotional necessity. In criminal circles, addicting drugs like cocaine or heroin are often given to members of the gang in order to make them more submissive to the leader who distributes them. The man who provides the drug becomes almost a god to the members of the gang. They will go through hell for him in order to acquire the drug they so desperately need. In the hands of a powerful tyrant, this medication into dependency can become extremely dangerous. It is not unthinkable that a diabolical dictator might want to use addiction as a means of bringing a rebellious people into submission. In May 1954, during a discussion in the World Health Organization, the fact was disclosed that communist China, while forbidding the use of opium in her own country, was smuggling and exporting it in great quantities to her neighbors, who have consequently been compelled to carry on a constant struggle against opium addiction among their own people and against the passivity which results from the use of the drug. At the same time, according to officials of Thailand who made the charge and who requested UN aid, Communist China has been sending all kinds of subversive propagandists into Thailand. Thailand charged that the Chinese were using every device they know to infect the Siamese people with their ideology, brain-weakening opium addiction, leaflets, radio, whispering campaigns, and so on. The Nazis followed a similar strategy. During the occupation of Western Europe, they created an artificial shortage of normal medicaments by halting their usual export of healing drugs to the inferior countries. However, they made an exception in the case of barbiturates. In Holland, for example, these drugs were made readily available in many drug stores without doctor's prescriptions, a situation which was against customary Dutch law. Although the right therapeutic drugs were not made available for medical work, 
the drugs which created passivity, dependence, and lethargy were widely distributed. The totalitarian dictator knows that drugs can be his helpers. It was Hitler's intention in his so called biological warfare to weaken and subdue the countries that surrounded the Third Reich, and to break their backbones for good. Hunger and addiction were among his most valuable strategic tools. What has all this to do with the growing addiction and alcoholism in our own country? I have already mentioned the alarming increases in death from barbiturates, but I would like to emphasize even more the psychological and political consequences. Democracy and freedom end where slavery and submission to drugs and alcohol begin. Democracy involves free, self-chosen activity and understanding. It means mature self-control and independence. Any man who escapes from reality through the use of alcohol and drugs is no longer a free agent. He is no longer able to exert any voluntary control over his mind and his actions. He is no longer a self-responsible individual. Alcoholism and drug addiction prepare the pattern of mental submission so beloved by the totalitarian brainwasher. Hypnotism and Mental Coercion From time immemorial, those who wanted to know the inner workings of the other fellow's mind in order to exert pressure on him have used artificial means to find the hidden pathways to his most private thoughts. Modern brainwashers, too, have tried all kinds of drugs to arrive at their devious objectives. The primitive medicine man had several methods of compelling his victim to lose his self-control and reserve. Alcoholic drinks, drinks, toxic ointments, or permeating holy smoke, which had a narcotizing effect, as used by the Mayas, for example, were used to bring people into such a state of rapture that they lost their self-awareness and restraint. The victims murmuring sacred words often revealed their self-accusing fantasies or even their deepest secrets. In the Middle Ages, so-called witch ointments were used either voluntarily or under pressure. These ointments were supposed to bring the anointed into touch with the devil. Since they contained opiates and belladonna in large quantities, they could have been absorbed by the skin. Modern science can explain the ecstatic visions they evoked as a typical hallucination-provoking effect of these drugs. One of the first useful techniques medicine delivered into the hands of the prior into souls was the knowledge of hypnosis, that intensified mental suggestion that makes people give up their own will and brings them into a state or into a strange dependency on the hypnotizer. The Egyptian doctors of 3,000 years ago knew the technique of hypnosis, and ancient records tell us that they practiced it. In the hands of an honest therapist, hypnosis can be extremely useful, particularly in dealing with psychosomatic diseases and with physical pain. That bastard son of fantasy and reality, hypnosis, is the Good Samaritan. But there are many quacks who practice hypnosis not to cure their victims, but to force them into submission using the victim's unconscious ties and dependency needs in a criminal, profitable way. There are unconscious sexual roots in hypnosis related to the passive yielding to the attacker, which the quack uses to give vent to his own passions. I once treated a girl after she had gone to such a healer. It was only at the very last moment that she had been able to get out of her lethargic, submissive state and fight off his assault. And I'll stop it right here. And we will pick up with Chapter 3 of Rape of the Mind in the next video. We will be reading Part 3 of Chapter 3. See you there.